Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Gents. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This episode of Garden DC, we're joined by Drew Asbury. He's a horticulturist and volunteer manager at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens in Washington, D.C. He's responsible for the Cutting Garden and the Horticultural Volunteer Garden. Welcome, Drew. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for having me today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I hate to interrupt your vacation. Uh, that's okay. This is this is well worth it. Talking about plants with a fellow plant lover um, is certainly worth a little break um, from my vacation. Yeah, it seems like us plant people, there's no such thing as a vacation, actually, we're always in the plant mode, right? Well, I will say I was just mowing the yard about 45 minutes ago and, and staking the echinacea that had blown over. Um, so, yes, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. Mm-hmm. Even our our downtime, our vacations, our shopping, it's all about plants, plants, plants. I will say I'm, I'm looking forward to gardening during my vacation. So, yes, uh, yeah, we're all there. So that does bring up Drew. Do you do you have that cobbler's shoe syndrome that your work gardens look perfect, but your home gardens you wouldn't want anybody to come and visit? Well, okay, at moments in time, yes, but um, you know, I think as all gardeners, it's certainly a different style of garden at home. It's much looser, and you know, I just mentioned staking up some echinacea, which is the rare exception. There, there's very minimal care at home, um, very minimal watering. Um, you know, it's kind of the you know, plant it and see who survives kind of theme at home. Um, But, uh, but no, I would definitely say uh, uh, the the gardens at Hillwood certainly have a lot more maintenance and, um, and uh, yeah, my time is much more devoted to those. than than Then I, it's good to hear that at home you practice that laissez-faire survival of the fittest gardening. Uh, yeah, of course, of course we, uh, you know, and, but that kind of makes it fun too. And I will say, you know, I don't want to, started right away on native plants, but my home garden has a lot more native plants, which are a lot easier to take care of than um, uh, the cutting garden at Hillwood is, is um, it's certainly not a low maintenance garden. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, as, as you know, as, as all gardeners know, it depends about it, a lot about which plants you, you plant in your garden. Um, so yeah, native plants, uh, thumbs up there on low maintenance. Great to hear. And do you have any particular favorite native plants that work in your home garden? Uh, well, I'm looking out the window now, and of course I see my black-eyed Susans and the cone flower. There's a big silphium coming up into bloom. Uh, the joe pie weed is looking really nice right now. Uh, a lot of different agastaches are out there. Um, a saline. At least that's what I see at the moment. That's, that's Oh, pycnanthemums. You know, we could go on and on, Kathy. So, uh, yeah, which native plant isn't a good one to have, right? Exactly. So in our last episode, we spoke all about native plants with Sherry Wilson. And for those listeners interested in learning more about natives, I urge you to listen to that episode and to check out Sherry's blog, nutsfornatives.com. Now back to Drew and all about you. When our Washington Gardener readers probably last encountered you was when you spoke for us at our annual seed exchanges on growing a cutting garden from seed. Um, that was a couple years ago. And at that time, we, you had said you had over 200 cultivars of cut flowers in production at Hillwood. Is that true? Yeah, Kathy, you know, as plant people, I, I would say that number is closer to 300 now. And it's it's truly, it's a hard number to get because, you know, it's, you know, are you counting all the different cultivars of zinnias and sunflowers and lisianthus? But, um, but I think our goal, we've certainly on the, the evolution of uh, diversifying the cutting garden at Hillwood. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do, I work a lot with our um, floral and event decor designer, Amy Wilbur. And I think... Um, as, as you know, you know, in the wintertime when you're flipping through those seed catalogs and um, you start, uh, you know, your wish list gets longer and longer. Um, and fortunately at Hillwood, we kind of have the resources and the space. Um, 
uh, to actually um, grow quite a large amount of different plants. So um, it's just hard to resist um, always trying out new things. And then, of course, you always have the plants that are it, you have to grow every year. They're kind of your meat and potatoes. And then always switching things up a little bit. So yeah, if I had to put a number, I would say 300, but really I don't know. Wow. Well, one of these days I'll have to go over, visit and help you count. Hey, you let me know what your count is. <laughs> so you said you have a lot of space for that cutting garden. What is the actual square yeah, footage? Yeah. So the cutting garden, it's, it's laid out. It's about a quarter of an acre, somewhere between a quarter and a half an acre. Um, you know, it's laid out very similar to uh, um, the, a traditional cutting garden. You know, there's long, skinny rows, very narrow aisles between those rows. It's all about maximizing the space um, and but yet allowing, um, you know, easy harvest and easy grooming and all that to go on, too. So um, long, skinny rows. Um, yeah. And then uh, and then I think, you know, the idea is over a quarter of an acre, you know, that turns into about maybe 30 rows that are about 40 feet long. So surely enough room to grow quite a few, uh, quite a few cut flowers out there. Wow. The mind just boggles at that amount of growing space for just cut flowers. And that's only one little portion of, of Hillwood Estate. Yeah, um, Hillwood, we, we were the home of, uh, for, for your listeners that aren't too familiar with Hillwood, we are uh, officially Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens, and we are the, the former home of Marjorie Merriweather Post, um, and we're a 25-acre property um, uh, in northwest Washington, D.C., and um, the cutting garden is just one, one component of the, the property. The, the gardens are divided up into a series of garden rooms. And um, so we have, uh, besides a cutting garden, uh, a more formal French parterre garden, a Japanese style garden. Uh, we have the lunar lawn, um, quite a few different woodland paths and uh, a formal rose garden. There's a little putting green there. Uh, Marjorie Post was an avid golfer. So uh, the putting green is always a bit of a charming moment on, on the garden tour. So uh, plenty to see at Hillwood. And some really unusual attractions like the Russian, is it a Dhaka? Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, well, hey, that's not my world of things, but I say Dacha. But, um, but yeah, uh, Marjorie Post was an avid collector of French and decor French and Russian decorative arts. So the, the Dacha comes from the, the Russian side of things. But, uh, but yes, it's your opportunity to see um, Fabergé eggs as well as all types of other little... Uh, Little fun, little fun things. I admire the fact that she left the estate and gardens in a shape for a public garden that she had left in, I believe, an endowment. Yes, yes, uh, we're pretty well taken care of, and yes, she uh, she purchased Hillwood back in the fifties. She lived there during the sixties and seventies, um, and while she lived there, she was entertaining there. She was, a, you know, she loved. She was a fabulous entertainer, uh, but she lived amongst her art. She was curating her art. Um, and at the same time, developing the gardens that surrounded the property. So um, besides myself, we, we do have, there's about 11 or 12 full-time staff members um, in the horticulture department at Hillwood, um, just to take care of, 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 the, of the gardens that um, Marjorie Post uh, left for us. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the gardens, of course, we have the interior displays and collections that visitors can take advantage of. And uh, visitors are also allowed inside the greenhouse to see her vast orchid collection. Yes, good. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, she was uh, uh, a little before her time when it comes to having a, a collection of over 2,000 orchids um, back in the 1960s. Um, and yet, just yet one more tradition uh, that we carry on um, at Hillwood. And yes, the orchid houses are open. We, we call them working greenhouses. So uh, when you come to Hillwood, you see every single orchid, um, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, and uh, so you, you get to see a little bit of everything behind the scenes. Talk to me about some of these ugly orchids. Is there ah. such a thing? <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess, you know, a lot of public gardens, they have their blooming showcase where they bring out the pretty stuff, you know. So for us, you, you see every single orchid in our collection. So I think it's great for, uh, you know, the, the, the big orchid enthusiasts out there that want to see a really a, a wide diversity of plants. Um, but, you know, orchids, you, you know, they're grown for their flowers, okay? So a lot of orchids are, do not necessarily have the most attractive foliage in the world. Um, but, you know, we do our best to disguise that. We, we, inter we incorporate a lot of tropical foliage um, and make different types of displays in the greenhouses as well, be besides just orchids. 
Yeah, that's an excellent point, Drew, that with a working greenhouse and every plant is actually where it's being grown and on display and there's no hidden back room where you're taking out the best and brightest that's in bloom, everything is out there to look at. So you get to learn a lot. Yes, you definitely, definitely do in, in the greenhouse. And let's talk a little bit about the volunteer program that you're in charge of. So there's volunteers who can specialize in, you know, say they were orchid orchidophiles or wanted to be out in the cutting garden. What are the opportunities yeah. there? So as an organization wide, uh, Hillwood has over 350 volunteers and about 100 of those volunteers uh, assist in the horticulture department and in virtually every aspect of, of the garden. So as you mentioned, the, the, there's orchid volunteers. There are volunteers that work with our floral uh, department. I have volunteers out in the cutting garden. Um, each week we probably have, you know, okay, before in the before times, um, you know, every week we would have about maybe five or six hands um, out in the cutting garden to help out. Um, and then, you know, there's some uh, lots of other outdoor gardeners that have uh, uh, volunteers assisting them too. So, yeah, we, we definitely realized this year with the pandemic when uh, mid-March came about and, you know, as the world was shutting down, we also had to ask our volunteers to stay at home, to stay safe. Um, but as you know, a garden continues to grow um, uh, regardless of what's going on in the world around us. So um, we definitely kept ourselves busy this year, but we also certainly realized that those 100 volunteers are so critical to the success of Hillwood that um, we, we really can't do what we do um, without all those extra hands and, and, uh, and, and involvement um, with our volunteers in the garden. So, uh, uh, yeah, we'll be looking forward to the days when we have all of our volunteers back. And are there some side perks to being a volunteer other than drinking in that wonderful Hillwood atmosphere? Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, if, I think the volunteers of a public garden, you're, you're first and foremost, they're gardeners themselves. So as you know, it's always fun for a group of gardeners to get together and talk about plants. But uh, the perks, uh, of course, there's always lots of free plants. Um, there's a lot of the cut flowers, for instance, that are self-sowers and are a bit aggressive self-sowers. So uh, uh, people are out digging up uh, little seedlings to take home. Uh, we do quite a few different educational programs, plant walks through the gardens, um, you know, so we have a few lecture series, um, but maybe that's a better question for the volunteers, but um, I think there's perks out there besides just, you know, it gives them the ability to get their hands in the dirt. You know, many volunteers have moved or downsized to a condo, um, and this allows them to get out there and, you know, get the sweat on and, and get their nails dirty kind of thing. That's a terrific point. You know, many public garden volunteers, that is their garden at that point. Yeah. Hey, we'll take it. We'll take them. <laughs> you had me at free plants, Drew. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there's a lot of free, that's the perk of being a gardener at a public garden. There's a lot of plants rolling around, you know. Well, for our listeners, I, I did want to fill in a little bit about Marjorie Merriweather Post. Um, she was the owner, of course, of the Postum Cereal Company, which became eventually General Foods. Um, and she was actually director of the company from 1914 to 1958. So it's a, a good long span. Um, and her second husband was E.F. Hutton, who expanded the business and acquired other food companies like Jell-O and Maxwell House um, and rolled it into General Foods Corporation. But one of the other big things that she's known for, aside from uh, her legacy at Hillwood, is that she was the owner of Mar-a-Lago um, in Palm Beach, Florida. That was her mansion down there. That, yeah, beautiful summary of uh, Marjorie Merrick Post. She also had many other homes through her lifetime. And so I, I'll add that uh, Hillwood was kind of the culmination of all of her homes. You know, uh, I often describe it as that um, she took many of her favorite elements of her previous homes um, and recreated those at Hillwood um, because Hillwood was her, her final home of her lifetime. Um, and so like the cutting garden, for instance, you know, a, a, an estate owned by Marjorie Post, a cutting garden, a greenhouse and such were just common components to, um, to an estate, you know, and they, they were to, you know, basically supply the house with those beautiful flowers and potted plants um, for that lifestyle that she led. And she was a big believer in having lots of bouquets of fresh flowers around the house. I don't think she was a fake flower person at all. 
Yeah, I don't think so. I think so too. You know, I've seen more elaborate photos than I had ever seen um, when it comes to particularly orchid displays. Um, and then, heaven forbid, when a, when it was time for a wedding, uh, Marjorie Post definitely do, knew how to go overboard with floral um, during wedding season. Yeah, if anybody wants to Google some of those photos, they are impressive. And I remember, maybe I'm not remembering the story totally correctly, but that lots of orchids were grown there and then shipped down by train for use at Mar-a-Lago or, or was it the opposite direction? Oh, no, we do tell that story. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, gardeners would prepare. Um, I mean, when she did travel, she, cause she, she lived in three homes simultaneously and Hillwood was her kind of spring and fall, um, um, homes. And she went to Mar-a-Lago, of course, in Florida during the winter time. And then during the summertime, she went to Camp Topridge, which was up in the Adirondacks. Um, so, you know, th- four times a year, she moved along with an entire arsenal of, of vehicles and staff. And part of that was packing up orchids that were either budded or that the staff would knew would bloom while she was away from Hillwood. Um, and then so then she could enjoy those blooming orchids um, while she was at her other homes. I think that's a job I'd like to have applied for, the orchid valet. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just escort those orchids from home to home. Yeah. I was also going to mention the interior of the mansion uh, for Hillwood is one of my highlights is that it is a home that has been crystallized in time in the that 60s to early 70s period so when you go and visit and see the uh, extensive kitchen and butler's pantry everything is of the era and of that age and it's like stepping in a time machine i just love that period of time so that's wonderful to see and my other favorite room in the house is the pale lavender screening room i'm not sure if that's the exact name of it but i could definitely move in right to there I mean, all I need is the big screen, a nice couch, and that's it. Yeah, I think that then um, I will add the the pink bathroom, I think, also kind of gives a nod to the 1950s. So, uh, but yeah, every room is unique uh, and relatively small uh, home for her standards, but um, certainly jam-packed with treasures. And I think uh, the staff does a good job of rotating some of the... Um, displays out because of course she has a very extensive french um porcelain limoges and then also of course the wardrobe and i know that sometimes i'll change that out seasonally yeah there's just like in the gardens uh, you know there's always something new to see at hillwood so inside the house as well so during this covid period um is the interior of the home open or is it just grounds only or how is how is it being handled? You know, as of today, you know, we're doing a slow, gradual reopening and probably about a month ago or so the, the grounds first opened up, but we're doing um, time ticketing entry, you know, limiting the amount of visitors on the property. Um, everybody, you, you sign up for a ticket online um, at hillwoodmuseum.org. Um, you pick your time, you want to enter the property. Um, and now we have added, there's a, a small number of people can go back inside the house um, with a second reserve ticket timing, just to limit. Um, but right now there's no official, you know, we have a lot of garden docents and house docents, but right now all, you know, tours and things, it's just kind of wandering on your own through the gardens um, and the house. Um, so yes, we are open, limited capabilities, you know. You know, all the new protocols in, the, in our world um, are a wood too. And I know before COVID that you were uh, giving occasional tours of the cutting gardens. Are those going to restart up? Yeah, you know, that was July of every year. So I guess that was just about right now is, um, yeah, is the cutting garden tour season. So, um, you know, who knows, Kathy, when groups and tours are going to be back. But we do have at Hillwood, we have a, what we call the Gardener Focus Series tours, which about every month out of the year, uh, there's different gardeners leaving, leading tours of their designated garden areas. Um, that combined with floral workshops and, and such like that. So uh, I assume maybe, you know, now we're doing a few uh, virtual type of things, but um, I assume as, as, as things get back to normal, all that will be back. 
And I was going to say for our listeners who are interested in visiting Hillwood or signing up for one of those potential tours or classes, it's hillwoodmuseum.org.org. Um, so Hillwood Museum, no dashes or spaces, just all one word. And um, I wanted to jump to talk about yourself, Drew, and your own background. So I know you graduated from Longwood Gardens Professional Garden Training Program back in 2006. And I wanted to ask you how you got to Longwood, where, how you started gardening, what were your childhood influences? Yeah, I would say probably, you know, I grew up in northern Delaware, so Longwood was only a 30-minute drive away from the house. And my family, we would be regular during the Christmas season. So I don't know if you've ever been to Longwood during the holiday season, but I mean, lights galore. And, um, but I don't think it wasn't until I was actually a student there that I actually went to Longwood during the the growing season. So, um, but I knew it was there. Uh, And I actually, um, I've always been a gardener. I remember even as a kid, I was out, you know, growing tomatoes in the family vegetable garden, um, enjoying pulling weeds, you know, the whole bit, you know, it's the same story. Um, And then in college, I started working at a mom and pop garden center, Um, absolutely loved it. Um, And it was actually somebody there, um, kind of a mentor there that said, hey, you should look, there's this program in Pennsylvania, um, because at that time, I went to school in Indiana. And they were like, you should really look into this student program at Longwood Gardens. And well, luck had it. I applied. I got in, and uh, it was probably the most uh, pleasurable and in, but intense um, time of my life. I mean, you literally eat, breathe, sleep horticulture for two years, um, and absolutely loved it. And I think um, that's where my love of public horticulture really came about from, which is you know you're sharing your passion of horticulture and engaging with visitors. I think is such a, a the most rewarding aspect of horticulture for me. Um, and then um, worked on a golf course for a little while, uh, moved around a little bit, but then that's kind of eventually my, my path brought me here to Washington, D.C., and just fortunate enough to, um, to find my way to Hillwood. And it's, uh, ever since then, I've just been um, toiling away at Hillwood in the gardens. Wonderful. And I know a couple of years ago when we saw you at the Seed Exchange, you were mentioned that you were working on a master's degree in landscape design from GWU. Is that still the case? Yeah, actually, I just graduated in May. So um, I'm officially done and I'm so grateful for that program, such uh, meeting such new uh, uh, ways of uh, new people, but also so many new ways of thinking about garden design. Um, from the sustainable or ecological point of view. Um, I really wasn't uh, expecting to be, uh, to have my mind so radically shifted to uh, the the world of sustainability. Um, But um, I think that's where maybe my newfound love of native plants has, has spurred uh, quite a bit um, from. Um, But, uh, but yeah, no, uh, the, the, the sustainable design program at GW is just an amazing experience, but I will say I'm happy I'm done with tuition payments. (laughs) <laughs> hey, well, congratulations for completing the program. I know there are some incredible instructors and yeah. a great curriculum there. Let's turn to the cutting garden that you maintain at Hillwood, because I have a ton of questions about seed starting and particular varieties. And the one you mentioned earlier is my absolute favorite cutting garden of all time, which is Lysianthus. Oh, and I know there's a little trick to yeah, growing you, it. You pick the uh, the hardest plant to yes. possibly grow. <laughs> um, and it's normally the one that we get a ton of questions about. And it's it's really the only one I tell people, like, look, you can grow these other 299 cultivars before you start growing Lysianthus. So I think it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one for us. So Lysianthus, I don't even know a common name. I think that is the common name, but a lot of people refer, they, they, they say, what's the plant that looks like a rose? So the flower itself is a bit rose-like um, and it only grows maybe 18, 24 inches tall. And for us, they're one of the very few that we actually buy uh, baby plugs, which are just, you know, baby little uh, starts in. Um, everything else we grow from seed. Uh, but Lysianthus is such a slow crop. Um, we buy in little plugs in maybe February. We'll grow them in the greenhouse for six or eight weeks. Um, we harden them off and then we transplant them out to the garden. Um, and then even then I, I cross my fingers, um, 
that they will be a successful crop. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, and then, you know, we, we're happy if we get, you know, they'll grow about 18 or 24 inches tall. We'll harvest. And often it's a single harvest for us. We're, we're quite excited if we get a secondary little flush, but, um, that's a lot. It's a really long crop time to get one great cut flower stem, you know, without without the ability to cut and come again. Mm -hmm. But so worth it because it is such a beautiful flower. These are one of your favorites. Have you had good luck with those? No, I've had the same experience <laughs> as, as you all drew that you have to start with started plugs. That starting from seed has been all but impossible. I tried one year, one year, and after like six weeks, they were still like the size of like, a, you know, I mean, a millimeter. <laughs> so yeah, don't recommend looking at this. And, but I will say every now and then I see them out at the garden center and I'm always shocked that some, that at, at garden centers, they're selling Lizzie at this plugs or Lizzie scarves. Yeah. Occasionally, very rarely, I'll see an offering of a six pack or, or started Lizzie Anthus um, through a, a mail order catalog. And that might be, probably the only way for a lot of people to be able to grow it. Um, and then I wanted to ask if you had find it to be a long living plant for you, but you did say you just got the one harvest from it because um, it is being listed in some places as semi hardy or even marginally hardy for us. I see that too. And I, I know of a cut flower farm like on New Jersey that they overwinter them and there's, you know, they're supposed to be able to take the cold and I don't know if it's the drainage, but at Hillwood, we don't use any of the frost protection or the little hoop structures. And I'm not sure if they require that, but I think just slightly south and then maybe along the coastal Jersey flower farms, um, they are supposed to be perennial. Um, I've tried to overwinter them um, at least two different seasons. And they just look so pitiful and hideous by the time spring comes around that, um, you know, uh, that space can be devoted to better plants early and early on in the season. So, um, yeah, Lysianthus is one that um, I'm just happy if we get a decent crop and then and then I move on. Yeah, and you're echoing my experiences as, as well. And I think it might be that on the eastern shore that they might be a tender perennial, uh, but for us, it's been tough. And if there are any listeners out there who have any Lysianthus tips and tricks to pass on to Drew or myself, we'd love to hear them. So an another annual uh, that many of us grow with success um, are zinnias that you mentioned earlier, but one of the drawbacks is usually powdery mildew or, or mildewed foliage. How do, you, how do you all cope with that? Well, I'll, I'll back up your story a little bit in that our, our approach with zinnias has changed over the years. Um, we used to be on a fairly re regular traditional fungicide program, um, but Hillwood, uh, organization-wide across the gardens, we're reducing our, um, our pesticide use, including fungicides and insecticides. So um, we no longer apply, actually, the, the cutting garden for the past two years has been um, pesticide-free. Um, and, um, other than we, we now use, uh, homegrown or home brewed compost tea. Um, and that if it's, if it's powdery mildew that you're concerned about, um, the compost tea seems absolutely fantastic for that. We spray that on my peonies, the dahlias, um, and the, the zinnias. That's kind of the three big crops that always have notorious foliar diseases, um, that tend to look kind of ugly by mid season. Um, often afflicted with powdery mildew, and we have found that a uh, compost brew, a compost tea uh, sprayed about once a week or so, um, completely organic, um, almost keeps everything very, very clean and tidy. Um, and then, you know, the other diseases that zinnias get, they tend to attract, you know, it's the bottom foliage that's the worst. Um, and so we'll just space out the zinnias. I purposely put the zinnias kind of in the center of the garden so that everybody can see their beautiful little heads that are floating up above everything. Um, but I don't put the zinnias right up against the main row or the, the front of the garden or anything like that. Um, because by the end of the season, normally the bottom half or bottom two thirds of the plant have defoliated. Yeah, it's definitely one of those plants you want to hide the, the petticoat or the underskirts. Mm -hmm. And 
your compost tea, do you have any special magical formula for that? You know, I wish I knew more about it. I know we have a we have a, a gardener, Matt, who's in charge of our of our worms. So we have our own little worm brewing, uh, our worm boxes. Um, we feed them our table scraps from our, our pork break room. Um, and then, you know, that turns into, uh, we'll take some of the, the compost that they've created, the worm compost. We brew that um, for a day or two in a big kind of a trash can. With big, lots of bubbles are going on. It's kind of a violent operation, but that's basically creating all these great microorganisms um, inside that compost tea, um, which then we just take it out and we strain it and then we apply it onto the plants. And, you know, the idea is that it, it, it puts all these great microorganisms and, and great fungi onto the plant that then colonize and, and that it takes up all the space that it doesn't allow those bad pathogens to come in and attack, as far as I understand. Hmm. And when you're applying it to the plants, you're spraying actually onto the foliage, both above and below? Yeah, you know, yeah, no, I think we really just do a top dressing, but maybe it depends on what we're doing. But we do that to all of our roses on the property, too. Um, and some other plants. But yeah, it's basically, yeah, you're getting everything, you know, a nice coating. Hmm. And zinnias are one of those great annuals that you can keep cutting and cutting from, and they'll keep producing more flowers for you over the season. Yeah, I don't know how you can have a cutting garden without zinnia. What are your other main standbys? Ooh, so main standby. So I will say over the years, we've been pushing more from um, annuals to perennials. So it, it really depends, you know, when, when I think of the cutting garden, I think of the different types of plants I have. So standbys with, you know, there's the annuals, there's bulbs, there's perennials. So I think if we're just talking about annuals now, besides zinnias, um, sunflowers, right? I mean, uh, such a fun, easy plant to grow. Um, cosmos are certainly in my top list of, you know, heat loving, you know, warm season um, annuals. Uh, we do a lot with, um, you know, self sowing plants too, which are kind of fun in the garden. So those are the plants that um, once you once you get enough of them in your garden and you let them go to seed, they'll they'll tend to scatter their seed and then come back on their own in future years. So um, some of the staples of those is uh, verbena bonariensis. That's a, I'm sure you're familiar with that one, Kathy. That's a fun one to grow. Um, even a lot of the cosmos come back for us each year. Um, and then there's a whole set of the cool season annuals too that are an absolute. Um, must so i think like larkspur is one of my favorites for the the spring season uh lots of nigellas i'm really a fan of the um orlea have, have you ever grown orlea do you know that one no i don't know that one you know i'm surprised it's amazing that it, it doesn't seem to be that common out there but it's it's like a queen anne's lace but a little bit heavier substance to the flower but uh yeah, I mean, Orlea, the only way you would grow that is to buy a $3 packet of seed and scatter it out in your garden. Um, it has really nice, fine, uh, finely dissected, ferny foliage, and then these big three, four inch wide uh, white flower umbels. Um, great filler amongst um, the spring bulbs and such like that. So, uh, so yeah, I, you know, the staples, it's hard to say staples when you have 300 different cultivars. <laughs> <laughs> And with the cosmos, do they require any spe special conditioning to add to the floral displays? Uh, so if we're actually arranging, so oh, it's a great question because, um, you know, is a cosmos a flower that lasts a long time? No. So, uh, you know, that would be the trick is, um, you know, zinnias are a great one because they actually can hold their substance for maybe up to a week in an arrangement. Um, so we do use, and I wish I knew the brand and such, but we do use a flower uh, kind of preserver slash food. So when we do our harvesting at Hillwood, we do it first thing in the morning, as early as we can, before the, the plants are stressed out in the heat. Um, we cut, and the, the, the goal is to plunge that stem within a second, you know, into that water to preserve its lifetime. So rather than collecting a bunch out, you know, in your hands and then walking inside the house and putting them in water, uh, take that bucket of water with you, um, immediately get it in water. We strip the lower foliage. Um, but I don't know of anything that makes Cosmos stand out other than just expecting that within a day or two, their petals are going to start kind of falling. 
Hmm, that's great advice because yes, I'm one of those that walks around my garden with a handful of cut flowers yeah. and it might be 10, 15, 20 minutes that I get sidetracked weeding before I get them back inside in water. I think we all do that to a little bit of extent, but um, the idea, yeah, the quicker you get them in, but you know, it's crazy. It is a science. And when you read books on harvesting cut flowers, every single flower in the professional world has its own technique of which temperature water, which chemicals do you mix in for longer shelf life? Um, some you actually you, you put into boiling water. I've never tried that. So that's supposed to be what you do for dahlias is you put stem in like an inch of boiling water to help, uh, I guess it helps push the air bubbles up through the stem. I'm not quite exactly sure. But um, we have a one set, you know, we use lukewarm water with our food preservative. We don't, we don't go too many, we don't make too many variations amongst our, our basic harvesting method. Yeah, there's some that, like poppies, I even heard that you take a, a match to burn the bottom up to stop the, the flow. Yeah, never done that either. <laughs> That's good to hear that we're, one step m works for almost all cutting garden flowers. And the dahlias that you're growing, are you doing the big dinner plate varieties or the small annual ones that have lots of flowers to cut from or both? Oh, a little bit of both. That, that's another one where the, the, you know, the catalogs are so tempting with dahlias. And I will say after Lysianthus, dahlias are probably the next most high maintenance problematic, you know, plant um, in the garden, or at least that, that, that require the most uh, fiddling with. Um, but, um, we do, we, we love, I met, I, I heard on one of your last, uh, podcasts, uh, you were talking about the Cafe Olay collection. Um, we absolutely love the Cafe Olay. I, I'm sorry, by Amy, our floral designer, um, Amy Wilbur, she loves, uh, we call them anything that has fleshy like colors. So those, uh, uh, the browns and the, the peaches and, uh, and that Cafe Olay kind of has a pinkish, whitey, creamy kind of color. And I consider those, maybe they're not dinner plates, but they're four or six inches um, in diameter. I love Vazio Megios. It's a huge kind of purple. It's one of our best performers in the garden. Um, and then we do grow a lot of the more of the ball type of flower form. And I think the ball form is more like a two inch flower. It actually holds up a lot better than those big dinner plates. But, I mean, who, who can't resist a dinner plate dahlia, um, even if it maybe doesn't necessarily have the longest shelf life inside an arrangement? Mm -hmm. Just one of those is a full bouquet in itself. That's all you need. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that you are loving the Cafe Ole as, as much as many other arrangers are. It's just such a wonderful plant. I feel like it's going to have a shortage in the plant catalogs next year <laughs> with it getting so popular um where do you source a lot of your plants so you're starting from seed mainly are you collecting seeds from your own plants you know we I, i've tried that a little bit but you know there's always where do you draw the line of your of how much time you have in a day so um uh i'll i'll do some i'll collect seed of some of the more unusual things but 90 percent of the seed we buy each year and i'm actually a big fan of johnny's seeds which has been around for you know forever um and they actually have a really um they have a great website they're available to homeowners too it's not just industry professionals um and uh I, they have a really great cut flower collection um and that's from mainly for seed um, I'm trying to think of the bulbs, I think, or for dahlias, we've been doing swan dahlias over the past few years. I think they're out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then I use, um, you know, for plugs, we'll, we'll work through a, a broker or such. Um, um, a lot of that's through Ball Seed Company um, for us. But um, I would think Johnny's, a park seed, that's a good one that all homeowners can use. Um, and, uh, but really, you know, Thompson Morgan, but if you just Google seed, uh, you know, nowadays with the internet, you can find a little bit of anything from everywhere. Um, this year I had a hard time. I was trying to find this really weird eucalyptus and I actually bought it from New Zealand. Um, it took a little bit of postage to get it here, but I had like, this weirdo eucalyptus um, from the other side of the world. Wow. And you didn't have any trouble getting that imported? No, you know, I, yeah, I, sometimes I'm accidentally bought seed, not realizing, but no, if I guess, um, no, it showed up at my doorstep. So, um, 
(laughs) (laughs) You know, and it was just the seat I wanted, so. Great. So somebody approved it uh, somewhere along the way, which is good to know. How early are you planning that cutting garden for next year? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I mean, the goal is to actually we we uh, we incorporate it into our entire crop schedule for all the plants at Hillwood. But uh, the goal is to actually have that done by around December 1st, because then the month of December and January, we can source seed um, because some of the seed actually starts. We, the eucalyptus is that what we start the first uh, set of seeds we sow each year and we'll start sowing that seed in December. That'll be eventually planted out in the garden the following April or May. So it's, it's one of the slower growing uh, seeds that we do. Uh, But eucalyptus can also stay in a pot for a longer time without getting uh, root bound or stunted. Um, So it's a, it's a good one. Um, And then basically every week from January 1st on, uh, you know, we kind of spread out the seed sowing. So that, um, you know, the seed sowing is not the hard part. It's when you uh, have that little community pot of seedlings that needs to be divided and, and spread apart in their own individual pots uh, becomes a pretty busy task. And luckily at Hillwood, we have a whole team of volunteers that are um, and a greenhouse grower that are um, taking that side of uh, the action of the garden, all the, the initial growing. So that means that almost all the varieties are started from seed indoors in, in a commingled tray, an open tray where you're just throwing thickly sowing the seeds not in into individual little pots yeah we've tried to plug tray before but that uses so much space like we actually have a pretty small um growing greenhouse um and so yeah the idea is you you you, a little four inch pot you sprinkle a a bunch of seed on top of there um and then you keep an eye on it so then after a couple weeks you often have a little like a little forest of seedlings um, but then we, we prick them out individually and put them in a, you know, their final little, little container or so um, in the greenhouse. Mm-hmm. That does take a delicate touch and yeah. some patience. Yeah. Is there a favorite seed starting mix that you have? You no, know, I, you know, I, I would say for a homeowner, you know, any, you would go to the garden center and um, maybe purchase one that actually has the word germination mix on it. You know, it's a soilless potting mix. Um, the germination mixes just tend to have a little bit of finer, you know, ground up materials, but it's, they're often the same materials that's in the other bag of potting soil. So, you know, if you're just doing zinnias and sunflowers, I think you can use straight regular old potting soil. Uh, we're not too particular about about that. Hmm. And because you're starting in a greenhouse, you can start a little earlier and regulate the growing environment a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I will say Hillwood has a lot of perks and the growing greenhouse um, certainly makes my life a lot easier and it allows me to be a little bit more adventurous. Um, but with that said, not everything has to be started inside. Um, there's a whole subset of seed that the best way to grow it is actually direct sowing it out into the garden. Um, And a lot of that, which would make your life easier as a home gardener, um, you know, and a lot of those cool season annuals absolutely have to be done that way. So that Orlea I mentioned, um, the Larkspur, the Nigella, the the Queen Anne's Lace types relatives, um, you know, all of that, what's the bachelor's buttons, the Buplorums, you know, we actually buy seed of that each year and around mid-March, uh, because it's a cool season annual, uh, normally I'll go out and try to prepare a little bit of a, the bed a little bit by, scra- you know, scraping up and pulling any large weeds and, and you know, kind of opening up some soil, to some bare ground, um, and then just scattering that seed on the garden bed um, and then lightly kind of, you know, not really covering it, but I kind of scratch the soil again. Um, and so that whole process, you know, takes five, 10 minutes um, and eliminates the whole starting in a greenhouse. But, uh, but again, the greenhouse is nice for the warm season crops, the slower crops. It's nice for us because then you don't have to worry about the squirrels out there digging everything up right after, you, you know, you left the garden. And um, so it all depends on, you know, a lot of it's trial and error over the years. Mm-hmm. And direct sowing also gets past that hardening off process. Yep. Yeah, they wait till the right conditions, you know, and then they'll then they'll germinate and be on their own. You know, you just have to keep an eye on watering, I guess, when you're direct sowing seed outside or in a greenhouse. I think that's more critical than what type of soil. And I know we hadn't mentioned this earlier, too, but I should have mentioned the cutting garden at Hillwood is basically full sun. 
So, um, you know, I think most of the traditional cut flowers, and you see that too when you're driving down the highway and you see a cut flower farm, it's basically out there in the same conditions as people growing corn and soybeans. You know, it's full hot sun is what does most cut flowers. Uh, you get the best quality flowers. Are there any plants you're growing just for the foliage and not for the flower? You mentioned eucalyptus yeah. earlier. Yeah, we do a lot of different basils. Amy loves the different basils, herbs in general, um, rosemary, um, uh, eucalyptus, the basils. Actually, we really like baptisia, another native plant. So um, baptisia um, is a, such a low maintenance native plant that has the most gorgeous flowers in, was that April or so? Um, but then it has really clean uh, bluish foliage. Um, so we grow those. Um, we, we harvest some flowering stems, of course. But then that foliage, it looks to me very eucalyptus-like, but it's a low-maintenance uh, native perennial. So, um, you know, and Amy thinks outside the box quite a bit, too. She tends to go foraging throughout the grounds. So things that I never thought I would ever see in a floral arrangement, like... Uh, bittersweet vine or maybe some of the, you know, uh, random shrub materials or, you know, we haven't talked about shrubs at all today, but, you know, hydrangeas and, you know, there's anything out in anybody's yard can be considered a cut flower or cut foliage um, if you think outside the box a little bit. Mm -hmm. And in your cut flower garden, do you have a shrub section or is that just that you're grooming from the rest of the garden? Yeah, we're grooming those from, you know, luckily Hillwood being such a big property, we have monster shrubs. So, um, but in the cutting garden, I have put in a couple of those, uh, the little lime hydrangeas. Um, I put in a couple dwarf vitex, that blue diddly cultivar I really like. Um, we have, do have some scattered roses, uh, caryopteris, you know, so I guess the more small shrubs, um, and we do vines as well. We love that the native honeysuckle, major wheeler, the Lonicera sempervirens, uh, major wheeler. We'll grow some annual vines. Amy likes the kind of wispy, you know, that whimsy that vines add to an arrangement. So um, we do a couple of different clematis. Um, yeah, I guess. But it's the Garden Hillwood is 95%, you know, herbaceous, annuals, perennials, a few grasses. Mm -hmm. So when you're done with the cutting garden season, what do those beds look like? Are you covering them with a cover crop? Yeah, you know, that's always on the game plan. So, <laughs> so you know, as we've been adding more and more perennials through the years, the, there is some winter presence now in the garden. You know, initially when I first started, yes, it was bare ground um, the entire fall, you know, late fall, winter season. Um, but now when you, you know, when you're putting in those early spring bulbs that are coming up as early as January and February, and then, you know, you're planting Sheffield daisies, which go all the way into November, you know, um, and leaving up a lot of the, uh, the herbaceous material to provide habitat for, you know, all those overwintering butterfly, you know, larvae and the insects. So, so I think that's one, you know, that's always one goal for, for me. I, that's, uh, is how to make that garden look attractive 12 months out of the year. And I do kind of give up on January and February a little bit, but, um, but yes, cover crops would be a, a fantastic way. And that is something that I'm, I'm venturing into, but the struggle that I've had is that the garden goes so late into the year often that it's too late by the time I'm trying to sow a cover crop in December or January, I've had a hard time getting it to germinate, you know, rather than sowing it earlier in the season. So one of these years to start a line and we'll figure out how to get cover crops in there. <laughs> yeah, that's always the trickiness, especially in the vegetable garden as well as the cutting garden is when to pull and when to start that cover crop. Because by the time you're giving up on your last cool season uh, crops, then the cover crops should have already been started. For weeding. Yeah. What are you doing between the rows? Are you mulching with a wood chip mulch? Well, this is where the, that whole, the whole volunteer core comes in really handy too. So, um, you know, our volunteers pull uh, bag after bag after bag of weeds. But yeah, so those rows, we use um, playground chips. So it's a combination of smothering them with playground chips. And then I love what I call a scuff hoe or the saddle hoe, where you just kind of use that to kind of push through um, and weed. 
Um, we're going to venture into, we're going to test out some, you know, the horticultural vinegars as a organic uh, weed repellent, but it's, it's really a lot of scuff hoeing. It's manual labor, um, hand pulling, scuff hoeing, chips, um, and such like that. And those playground wood mulch chips, those are like the big hockey puck size type ones. Yeah, you know, every batch we get slightly different. So, um, but yeah, maybe hockey pucks are a little big. That's a little bigger than mine. But, um, but yeah, they're, uh, it's, a, it's a much more hefty uh, mulch as opposed to a hardwood or a pine pines. Because then the, there's other that where we're actually sowing plants and growing the plants in the little beds. We don't use any surface covering. So, uh, that's where weeds love open bare ground. Um, so the idea is to plant the garden very thick to eliminate those patches, you know, or open ground. So um, you might as well have something growing there rather than weeds, or at least that's the goal. Mm -hmm. And this past spring, it was a long, cool spring, and then we had a late frost that was in early May. How did you work around that? Oh, that, that frost was a killer because because with the pandemic and not having volunteers, we already felt that we were, you know, we were, we were already behind. We've been playing catch up this whole year. Um, and I remember uh, the cutting garden, I put in my celosia um, around May 1st. And celosia is one that gets really, really touchy. If it's in a cell pack and it starts to get any bit root bound, um, it immediately puts out a little flower head and it, it, it basically stays stunted. So it's always one that I very quickly get out to the garden. And then we planted it about, you know, at the beginning of May. And then 10 days later, that frost came. And normally at Hillwood, because we're at the top of a hill and we're in Northwest DC, like if I get a frost here at my house in the suburbs, Hillwood's always fine. But that did not happen this year, as you know. And I came in that next day and every celosia was just as black as black, you know. So, um, but by that point, we had already planted a lot of our summer seasonal displays and impatience and coleus were really like severely scorched and burnt. So it was a rather depressing moment. Um, but, uh, but with that said, you know, it was really only those super tender annuals, 95% of the cutting garden, um, went through that perfectly fine it was just those transplants that I had gotten out um, thinking that you know by May 1st normally we're safe you know but not so this year yeah it was such a crazy year and playing catch up is a very apt way to phrase it this year has been so crazy but I think we're finally mellowed out and back into our zone yeah I agree and are there any perennials for cutting gardens that you're adding in new oh no oh yeah now the new part um well no i you know um i think what was something new we've added a lot of, through the past couple of years i'll go back on my native pick here for a moment you know um you know uh let me think i mentioned baptisias joe pies we do a lot of the butterfly weeds um amy fortunately she we she describes her style of floral design as the garden aesthetic style so it's a very meadowy and there's a, there's a lot of variety and, and native plants just tend to um, align with that aesthetic. So that's worked out really well. But uh, we've been adding a lot of different garden phloxes, uh, the solidagos or the, the goldenrods, um, echinaceas, lobelias are quite fun to play with, the, both the blue and the red lobelia. Um, Monardas. Uh, Monardas is another one that we'll use for foliage early in the season because Monarda grows like a weed so quickly and it has beautiful foliage early season uh, long before it blooms. It looks kind of like a raw well, mint. Um, we've added panicombs. Probably one of the most exciting natives that we put in that gets a lot of attention is the, um, the rattlesnake master, the uh, Aringium yuccifolium. Uh, that when Amy likes in her arrangement, she just used some of it, you know, it looks like it's from, it looks like it's from out of, you know, it's an alien or something. So, uh, yeah, it's really dramatic looking and very, um, Southwest desert almost. Yeah. Yeah. And it's tough as nails. I mean, it's, it's just laughing at this heat wave we've been having, you know, it's, it's, you know, but great pollinator. So there's always that, so that was kind of the natives, but I, I, you know, thinking of the non-natives as I, as I, as I wander through my head down the rows, you know, we do a lot of Echinops, you know, Echinops have been in that garden since I've been there eight years and it's the same patch. It's, you know, one of those long lived, um, 
great, you know, uh, um, it's globe thistle is the common name. Um, we do, you know, we haven't even mentioned bulbs, but uh, we do all types of spring and summer bulbs. You know, the alliums, the ornamental onions, those are hard to beat in the spring. Um, uh, catmint, that's a great, you know, the catmint and salvia is what great, you know, lower, you know, um, they make good filler material for arrangements and super easy to grow. I mean, the list goes on and on, Kathy. It can be any perennial. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree that any perennial would make a great cut flower because, you know, I think, a, I think at home, you know, a, a gardener should look at perennials as the base of their cut flower garden, you know, build that as your base and then tuck in those annuals um, like the zinnias and the cosmos and the sunflowers. You can kind of tuck them in kind of randomly. Um, and then you throw in the layers of seed uh, by just broadcasting. Um, I mean, the trick there is learning what the seedlings look like, you know, um, and distinguishing those from weed seedlings. Um, and then if you throw in a layer of bulbs, you know, you can have your allium bulbs and they all kind of intermingle um, together. And then you can put in some summer blooming bulbs like lilies that kind of shoot up through everything. So you know, as gardeners, the garden's never done, and you're constantly adding and tweaking, and plants come and go. So uh, I think that's the fun part of a cutting garden is that there's really there's not strict rules. It's all about flowers. So you know, any anything goes kind of in a cutting garden. And anything goes is a perfect philosophy. What do you say to those gardeners who say, I would never cut from my perennial garden, that that's just for outside and they kind of don't even consider bringing them inside? Yeah, I, I think you have to get over that hurdle. And I will say, I understand that completely because when I first started at Hillwood, like it bothered me that that aspect of that garden was that ultimately the whole purpose is to cut those and take them inside, arrange them and put them, you know, on display. So, I mean, why not? I think that's where, you know, planting thickly and, and overboard with lots of plants where, you know, the goal is, is that once Amy's done her weekly harvest, it's often hard to tell that she just collected, you know, 500 stems from the garden. So I, I think when you think about it that way, and then the joy that they bring, when you bring them inside the home, you know, um, you know, I, I would say just go for it, you know, and then again, think outside the box. You don't have to cut your one peony flower, cut some of that birch tree that you've got, you know, a thousand stems on um, or hack back that forsythia, um, you know, and, you, you, you know, use anything. Flowers are so ephemeral in any case that I feel like it's not that much of a sacrifice, whether you're cutting it it's first or second day in bloom versus it's going to be out of bloom in eight to 10 days. Yeah, I agree. I, I think you just go for it. Now I will say at home, you know, I've got kitties, so kitties and flower arrangements do not really work so well together. So <laughs> I don't have that issue at my home because I'm like, no, I enjoy them out in the garden because it'll just cause a mess if I bring them inside. And when that staff florist comes through and collects her 500 uh, cuts every week, do you ever follow behind her and say in your head maybe maybe not out loud please not that one well that's funny and i wish that you answer you could ask her that question and see her response but uh, <laughs> there used to be more rules you know there were certain areas that she wasn't allowed to cut from but now now that the whole garden has evolved over the past eight years um and um i actually i actually enjoy you know, now there's there's virtually no rules. Amy can harvest what she feels is necessary to harvest. But some of those areas, I do say, hey, Amy, what, well, how about if just you harvest those? You know, we love our volunteers to death, but sometimes if a volunteer is harvesting, they might over harvest and not really realizing what Amy needs. So I tell Amy, like, hey, Amy, if you just need one of these or two of these, like you come cut whatever you want, you know. But maybe we won't have a volunteer harvest the whole bucket from the front row of the cutting garden. It's, it's all teamwork, you know. And again, plants, they're designed to be cut. And then it often it helps them, you know, bloom out more, you know. And I always say that's the best way of deadheading is to gather bouquets. And then you're not having to come back and just cut spent blooms that you're not even able to use at that point. Of course. Well, Drew, this has been fabulous. And I thank you so much for taking us through your cutting garden and sharing its bounty with us. 
Hey, Kathy, this was absolutely great being here today. Thanks for having me on and um, happy gardening. Plant Profile, Monarda. Monarda, commonly known as bee balm or wild bergamot, is a native perennial flower that provides pollen and nectar for numerous types of pollinators and seeds for the birds. It is also a dramatic and attractive flower in its own right. It prefers consistently moist soil that receives full sun to part shade. Monarda is almost carefree in the garden, except that it's vulnerable to powdery mildew, a fungal infection that can look unsightly and cause a loss of the lower leaves, but will not kill the plant. One way to address this is to plant it at the back of the border to disguise the infected lower foliage. Another way is to select Monarda varieties that are more resistant to the powdery mildew. Our cover story in the January 2017 issue of Washington Gardener magazine by George Coombs detailed the Monarda trials held at the Mount Cuba Center in Hawkinson, Delaware. They went through three years of evaluations to determine disease resistance as well as other desirable traits. The top performers include Claire Grace, Violet Queen, Raspberry Wine, Purple Rooster, On Parade, and Garden View Scarlet. Monarda is also an herbal plant and is a member of the mint family. It releases a pleasant scent when you crush a few of its leaves, but like its mint cousins, it has a spreading habit. So surrounded by companion plants that help keep this rampant grower in check. Monarda should be divided every three to five years. Without division, the center of the plant will start to die out, creating a blank hole in the middle. If that happens, replace the dead interior section with a chunk from the healthy outside area of the plant. You can easily dig and share a portion with a fellow gardener as well. The best time for division is in late summer to early fall. Monarda, you can grow that. Adventures in Garden Speaking Murphy's Law and all that It was a dark and stormy night. Well, the storms hadn't started yet when I began my talk for the Anacostia Watershed Society at their historic headquarters in Bladensburg, Maryland. It's a former tavern that was a favorite socializing spot of George Washington's. I set up my laptop and projector in the upstairs meeting room and everything started off smoothly when all of a sudden A tremendous wind blew in and all the windows slammed shut with a bang. We were plunged into darkness and I was only a quarter way through my slideshow describing local native plant choices. Luckily, my laptop battery was fully charged and I was able to turn the screen around so the small crowd gathered there could see the plant photos while I completed my talk. But what if it hadn't been charged? Would I have been able to continue on without it? From that day forward, I promised myself to always be prepared to give any talk with or without audiovisual assistance. That vow has been a lifesaver when I have found myself in situations that ranged from challenging to sublimely ridiculous. For instance, I once was assured that a garden club's host had a projection screen in her home, only to arrive and find that not only was there no screen, but there was also not one blank wall available. I ended up giving the talk while projecting onto the surface of a large Turkish brass serving tray. If you speak enough, you will have many similar stories to share. Here are some of my tips for being prepared for all speaking emergencies. Have backups. Even if the host says they have all the equipment, bring your own laptop and projector along with extra cords and save your file to a USB drive. Print out your PowerPoint slides and notes. Always have one set in your bag that you can refer to should your AV display fail. Use props. I give a talk on garden tool selection and maintenance that is purely me talking and doing show and tell. The same with my talk on basic flower arranging. There are many times when you are much better off doing a live demonstration rather than using a PowerPoint slideshow. 
always have one or two of these talks prepared and ready to go as a substitute just in case you arrive at your venue and Murphy's Law has prevailed. By the way, I'm part of a speakers bureau called greatgardenspeakers.com. Our goal is to make it easier for garden clubs, botanical gardens, and other groups to find the kind of high quality speakers that they are looking for. If you know about groups that are looking to book quality garden speakers, please let them know about it. For this week's What's Blooming in the Garden, I wanted to talk about one specific plant that is putting on quite a show right now. It's Canna South Pacific Orange F1. That F1 stands for filial one, meaning a first generation hybrid. It's the sister of a 2013 All America Selections winner, South Pacific Scarlet. This one was introduced in 2019 and I was sent a trial plant in May of that year. Was I a good plant parent and take it out of its little pot and planted it up in a bigger pot right away or in the soil? Nope. I ignored it. I neglected it. I left it in that tiny little four inch pot all season long. And then as winter's cold started to set in, I thought, hmm, I shouldn't just let this die outside. I'll stick it in a big bag of peat moss with a couple other corms and bulbs that I pulled out, um, a few dahlias and a few other things, and literally threw it to the bottom of the bag, put the bag in my inside closet, because I have no basement, no uh, shed to speak of, and no garage. So it stayed next to a furnace, basically. There's a little side window there, and about... February, I noticed something interesting back behind my furnace. Growth from that bag was peeking out. A few of the dahlias were trying to set flower and this canna was pushing out new leaves. So I pulled it out, rolled the bag back and let them blossom. Then as it warmed up outside, I planted this canna in its own big pot and it has really come into its own. It has attractive, vivid, bright orange flowers on bright foliage. Um, I've seen a few pollinators on it, but no hummingbirds yet, cross fingers. And this will be one canna I actually do dig up and bring inside and store again next winter. I don't do that with many plants because as I said, I don't have much room for overwintering tubers and things of that sort. But this one is special and it's done very well for me despite all the neglect and abuse I've put it through. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener Magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.